November 2019. <laughs> that feels like such a long time ago. Four and a half years to be exact, but man, oh man, I remember it just as vividly as yesterday. It was an extra damp autumn that year. Didn't have much to do in my sleepy little Iowa town besides stand around in the pouring rain, so being the dorky 15-year-old with a passable understanding of Sony Vegas that I was, I decided to stay in and make one of my first popular cartoon-related videos. A commentary-style response to a review of the, at the time, new popular indie animated pilot, Has Been Hotel. Now, the review itself, a rant on the series by... Hmm... I'm trying to think of a term that would describe this guy without coming off mean. Um... Professional cringe analyst, that still sounds like I'm insulting him. It was P.K. Russell, okay? P.K. Russell did a big roast of the show, a lot of people said it was bad for a bunch of reasons, and to be honest, one of them was me. Yeah, I was a big fan of the pilot at the time, who thought his points were garbage, so I made this poorly edited, underexplained, reactionary video in, I think, two days? And, you know, looking back, I gotta say, I hit it on the goddamn head, man. That review is a two-pack two of ass! I watched it again, like, just now to see if I was being too harsh or something, but no, dude, no. I it's really bad. It's unfair, it's annoying, it's downright head-scratching at times. I have no idea how anyone could have thought that mess of a critique would be well-received. And it's especially fascinating in the case of Has Been Hotel, as, in retrospect, the pilot isn't that great. It was a major step forward for indie animation, no arguing there, doors opened up, it was a real trailblazer and all, but as a pilot? It's incredibly flawed. There are several legit avenues he could have taken to criticize the show if he were better at reviewing, and at one or two points, he surprisingly does. Not every assertion he made was completely irrational, but those few decent critiques are drowned out by all these absurd, deceitful arguments. The majority of what he said was laughably clumsy, and so, unfortunately, being that it was the first major review of Has Been to garner traction online, it's sort of set the tone for how the fandom would view criticism of the show moving forward. With unrelenting hostility. And that sadly hasn't died down in the slightest. In fact, it may be worse than ever before. At least at the start, all you had to worry about was pissing off fans of the pilots, whereas nowadays, when people criticize anything made by the series creator Vivzy Pop, there's always this subset of people who think they're being nitpicky and unfair when usually they aren't. And look, I get it. That piece the PK video really is the epitome of bad faith incompetence, and there have been plenty of poorly written videos exactly like it since. But we also have to remember that just because one person's negative thoughts on a work were invalid, that doesn't mean it's perfect. Giving the pilot a cursory glance a few weeks ago, I found several serious issues you could fairly point out. The pacing's all over the place, the art direction is stylized but impractical, the actual concept, that being the princess of hell redeeming sinners at a hotel isn't properly showcased whatsoever. My point is, it isn't and has never been totally flawless, no matter how stupid some complaints of the thing have been. So, while I might have negative things to say in this video, I want you all to know that it isn't coming from a place of malice. To the contrary, I've been anticipating has been from the moment A24 and Amazon picked it up for a full series, as there's so much potential in the premise, and the passion is there. It wouldn't have gotten where it is today if Vivian Medrano and her team didn't work their asses off. No matter what I got to say about her work, I have major respect for her as a creative and a hardworking individual. She has many admirable traits traits in spite of her flaws, and she's been developing this concept for 10 years, so I was optimistic she could bring her vision of the show to reality. Plus, with the help of a major studio and industry professionals through almost four years of production, there's no doubt in my mind that her usual writing works, probably wouldn't make it through to the end, so I was cautiously hyped the more and more we started hearing leading up to release. As a fan of the indie talent, I was sad to see the old VAs go, but as a musical theater kid, seeing them getting Broadway stars as replacements? I'm not even gonna pretend I wouldn't jump at the chance to do the same, that's rad. And aside from that, with the reveal trailer, we found out the series had already been picked up for a second season, which was pretty cool to see. Like, normally I'd have my reservations about a new 
new series preemptively getting two seasons. Looking at you, Clone High Season 3. But for has been, I'd say I was more happy than worried for the reason that, besides having a pre established fan base to keep the series going either way, Medrano and crew clearly have a lot to say, so the security of a second season can really help a team relax and focus on what's in front of them. They don't gotta be quite as reluctant about adding plot threads meant to be resolved in a season two that never comes. There's a luxury to experiment and space things out, so it doesn't end up feeling too crowded. And for a serialized show like Has Been, that sounds perfect. All that was missing now, the final piece of the puzzle, if you will, was the number of episodes that first season would be. A piece of info that's very important, as regardless of how many seasons it ends up getting, that first set of stories is going to be the foundation of everything else to follow. So a solid episode count would give a good picture for what to expect at the start. 16 to 24 could have room for a bigger story, 13 to 10 might stick to being character driven with hints at more to come, there was a good amount of wiggle room for how long it could potentially be, or so I thought until the series officially came out in January, and it was revealed they had a grand total of... Uh, Bert, there's something wrong with my script. Y yeah, but it says eight episodes, there's no way that... Is that a yes nod or a no nod? Oh... Oh my god. Oh my god! Okay, so follow me here. Madrano has always been an artist that loves her ideas. She adores adding any and all the lore, characters, or minute little details she can think of to her series. And if there's one thing I've learned from her other main project of the past couple of years, Hell of a Boss, it's that she can't handle not using them as soon as humanly possible. If she has a character or lore piece or plot point she wants to add to the mix, she will, and on the surface, that doesn't sound like a problem. To someone who doesn't know her work, they may not understand why that episode count made me so terrified, but let me repeat, she needs to add every detail. Not one can be left on the cutting room floor. For example, Hell of a Boss was originally pitched as a series about contract killers in hell taking hits out on people in the living world. That was the pitch, and you could reasonably say they more or less stuck to it for the first five episodes. Sure, every once in a while there were slight deviations, mostly when they had to protect their ticket to the living world, a demon prince, the main character slept with for favors, but they still fit within the general bounds of the premise. That is, until episode 6 came around, where Madrano introduced the thought of a more complicated relationship between the main character Blitz and the royal Stolitz. And now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with adding a subplot to the series that provides additional depth for the characters, that's perfectly fine. But it wasn't just a subplot, now was it? No, it became the focus of the episode after that, and the tangential focus of the episode after that, and the focus of the episode after that, and the semi-focus of the episode after that. It and the character of Stolas quickly became so integral to the plot of the show, we didn't get another episode relating to the pitch until season two, episode five. An episode that, mind you, came out nine episodes and two and a half years years after the last one, and it wasn't the only new subplot either. Disregarding the boatload of villains they've set up to come back who haven't over the years, Season 1 Episode 7 introduced us to the duo of Fizzaroli and Osmodius, who, after getting a spotlight in that episode, return as basically the main leads of Season 2 Episode 6 alongside Blitz and Stolas again. And to be fair, this was sort of expected. Fizzaroli was set up from early on to be an integral part of Blitz his childhood, so it made sense that he eventually came back. What didn't really make sense though was that following this episode dedicated to the two making up, we got another full episode about Fizz and Osmodius with Blitz standing in as a side character. And keep in mind, these two episodes are longer than any the series had made before, so it was pretty much the equivalent of three full episodes where the rest of the main cast didn't appear at all. This is what I'm talking about 
about when I say Madrano can't let a concept go despite the restraints she's working with. She could write a four episode miniseries about kids hanging out at a skate park, and by the end, it had turned into a drama about the life of the guy who made their wheels. There's a consistent pattern of her under restraints struggling immensely with reining in her ambition, regardless of how simple the initial premise is. And so giving her a first season that's the exact same amount of time as the first season of Hell of a Boss, I just... I want to have a chat with whoever made that decision to let them know that we're all royally fucked. And I'm not being facetious when I say this show has no idea where its priorities are. You'd think it would be with, I don't know, the hotel, redeeming sinners by having them demonstrate they're worthy of a second chance, the thing the show's named after? Well, in a way it is, but also at the same time, it's really not at all. Let me explain. So, the lore of has been, as outlined in the opening exposition dump of the first episode, episode is that a portion of all sinners are purged every year in rituals by heaven called exterminations, where they die in hell, I guess. The details aren't important. All you need to know is that a lot of hell's population gets wiped out, and the princess of hell, Charlie, wants to change that by redeeming sinners so they can avoid it. See, she thinks the only reason heaven does the exterminations is that they don't have any other method to combat overpopulation. So, if even one soul can be redeemed, that means heaven will shift their focus to redemption as an alternative. Thus, in this first season, she's trying to prove the hotel's legitimacy before the next extermination, which is happening twice as quickly as usual due to an angel secretly having been found dead by heaven. The first time they've ever seen such a thing happen in 10,000 years. That's the basic idea we get from episode one, and so far so good, right? Charlie has a goal she wants to achieve, a motivation to get it done quickly, and there's an added mystery element that could come back later. All that's left to do is do what the show was billed as and help out her current guest, a drug addict an adult film star by the name of Angel Dust with the help of her ragtag hotel staff. But oh... Oh no. No, 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 you poor, sweet summer child, no. That is not how it goes at all. Maybe in an alternate universe where the series had more time or less plot to cram in, that could have been the outcome, but woefully for all of us, we do not live in that world. In reality, Madrano and crew couldn't compromise on how to balance the story and character, so it led to an outcome I like to call Diet Steven Universe. And before you ask, no, that's not a dig at the gay rep, okay? It's a dig at the pacing and the importance of plot in a serialized show. So, in case you're out of the know, Steven Universe is this Cartoon Network series that's had to endure a fairly sizable load of criticism over the years. Sometimes it was justified, often it wasn't, but one of the most mind-numbing complaints I ever heard about the show was that it didn't get to its main, overarching plot sooner, particularly in the first season, where in the beginning, it wasn't quite understood what the series was leading up to through all its stories, most of which were these slice of life semi semi-comedic shorts with dashes of world building, alien powers, and family stuff mixed in. It was kind of a low-key, relaxed show all around that could be serious when it wanted, but usually stuck to being fun and down to earth. Occasionally, though, in between all those seemingly one-off scenarios, there'd be these big, important episodes that help piece together the overarching narrative of the series, and they all started making sense by the first season finale, where the world of the show was revealed to be far wider than anything we could have imagined. It was a great closer to a season that spent a good chunk of its time building up to this special moment, knowing the impact it would have on the viewer once everything connected, and for a majority of fans, that's what it was. But a certain portion of the fan base surprisingly got mad at this unveiling for happening in episode 51. Why did we have to wait so long for this important revelation when the series could have easily removed all its filler episodes to focus on the most plot relevant portions? Two words character driven. That's the main appeal of Steven Universe, the cast and their relationships. It sets a status quo that fleshes out the group and the dynamics they have, making those expansions and shifts all the more fascinating to us as viewers who've gotten to know them on a deeper level. We learn their likes, their wants, their hopes, and it creates this picture that, if it weren't for those small touches to add emphasis, wouldn't make the focal point shine as brightly. Whether you like it or not, those episodes are just as important 
important to conveying what the series is and why we should care as the big events. They're necessary to not only give the audience a break from the heaviness, but to add depth to traits we wouldn't be as likely to see given depth otherwise. And has been comes off like a series that's missing those essential, less plot-heavy sections. Looking at the timeline of what happens when and where in each episode, I think it's obvious that prior to them getting a solid episode count, there was already a clear, pre-planned list of major events, setups, and twists that had to happen leading up to the finale. They needed to hit certain quotas to make sure it all came together decently in that big final showdown, but by virtue of them having such a small number of episodes and so little willingness to cut anything out, those same incident setups and twists often overwhelm the character drama and lead to unsatisfying conclusions. You wanna know who killed that angel? It was this girl, Hollow Knight. When do we meet her? Episode 3. When do we find out she killed the angel? Episode 3. Did she have any connection to the rest of the cast? No. Does she become relevant to any of the cast afterwards? Yes. In her next appearance, four episodes later, where she teaches the cast how to kill angels for the final battle. And in that same episode, her information is used by Alistair, one of the hotel staff, to make a deal with Charlie. That's all poor Hollow Knight is. A plot device. Could have been something if she were, well, more of a character. Would have made that twist, you know, actually come off like a twist with substance and weight and shit, but there isn't any room to slow down. Before you can process that development, the show is already on to the next one with another character who equally doesn't matter or gets screen time until they can be useful to the plot. And that's how it is across the entire season. Episode 2, for instance, is mainly about the rivalry between Alistair and Vox. Who's Vox? Some guy. Why does he matter? He doesn't! No, seriously. He gets the whole B-plot complete with a musical number about his one-sided rivalry with Alistair, and there's this implication that he wants to stop him and Charlie from making a deal, but then he doesn't do anything for the rest of the season. He just does his plot-related job of inadvertently giving the hotel another guest, the failed inventor and wannabe villain Sir Pentius, and then he goes off to the corner to wait for his chance at apparently being the main villain of season two whenever that is. Then, in episode 5, they really need to move the plot along to get to that final fight, so to speed up Charlie finding the tools to confront Heaven directly, they out of nowhere have her go, Ah! The hotel isn't working! I know it's been the focus of barely an episode and a half so far, so I get why you wouldn't understand, but technically, in in-universe time, it's literally been four months! There isn't much time left! Ugh, I guess I'll have to call my deadbeat dad and speedrun solving our long-standing emotional dissonance. Boy, it sure is convenient that I was able to make up with my dad so fast. If I hadn't, I wouldn't have gone to heaven and provoked the angels into coming to my hotel, setting up the final conflict of the first season. Thanks, Dad! And third verse, same as the first, once his usefulness to the plot is gone, he fucks off until he can save the day midway through that final battle. Could have been there from the beginning, it's not like he had anything else going on, and logically, it would have made sense that he'd want to keep his daughter from possibly dying to help her dream, but narratively, that wouldn't have been as compelling, since Lucifer wins right away, and his presence most likely would have removed the need for Pinchus' sacrifice, it just wouldn't do! We had to wait for the rest of the cast to get their asses beat so that him showing up and winning effortlessly could be more impactful. That's why he doesn't show up sooner and has no excuse for why. He's another narrative tool. Granted, he isn't nearly as flat as the other two in terms of complexity, but still, he ultimately fulfills the same function as the others. They serve their purpose, they vanish without complaining, they come back when needed. They're the ideal office workers. It's fine as long as it's in service of getting to that finish line, right? Who cares about where they go, or what they do, or why we should care about them out of an immediate plot-related context. It's fine! Sure, if this season had more episodes to integrate them, they could have been less incidental or had some level of natural build-up before serving their main purpose in the story, but the crew didn't have time for that, and yeah, if they couldn't give those supposedly important characters the proper time they deserved, it probably would have been better if they were saved for later to put the focus elsewhere, like, I don't know, the, the hotel and its patients while thought, but 
we needed them to get to the finale. We could have given their roles to already established characters or changed the season plans knowing the limitations of our runtime, but we didn't, so... Eww. And hey, when all said and done, isn't that finale great? Pentius sacrificing himself, Adam, the head of the Angel Army, getting beaten by Lucifer and killed by a goofy side character, the imagery of the hotel our protagonists have come to know as home being destroyed and subsequently rebuilt, going from just an abandoned building to a monument representing the bonds these characters have formed over the season. Isn't it all so grand? Yeah, it is. It's a great ending for a better version of this show. One where Charlie connected with anyone other than her pre-established girlfriend, Vaggy, or the hotel itself meant anything to any of them. And them not organically accomplishing either is especially egregious considering I know what they're going for. They want the hotel to be the guild hall in fairy tale. This building that, regardless of its intended use, is a sanctuary for our found family. A safe place place where they can relax and be themselves, hang out with people they genuinely care about, a structure embodying the bonds they share and the help it's given them, making them want to fight for it alongside their fellow patrons when the angels intend on destroying it. I see the objective, but there are two important things keeping me from going along with it. The cast having a deep connection to the hotel itself, and them having a deep connection to one another. Both of these things are needed needed for this ending to click, but I don't think this season does a good job convincing us of either. And confusingly, in the case of the hotel, it sort of goes for the opposite effect, though I could get if you didn't notice due to how, to reiterate, it is barely utilized or discussed in terms of its effectiveness. Oh, we hear it discussed plenty as a concept, how Charlie plans to use it, how she wants heaven to give it a chance, etc. But we never hear or see how the hotel itself is affecting Angel and Pinchus in a positive way other than in episode 5 where Charlie is flipping out over why it isn't. No, you didn't hear me wrong. They briefly stated at the start of episode 5 that the hotel wasn't working like it should or helping the patrons, and at this phase in the story, that tracked with what we've been shown. Among the shockingly few scenes there are of Charlie attempting to redeem Angel and Pentius, there is one idea that's plainly communicated. She does not know what she's doing. Charlie is completely out of her depth. Her deepest understanding of what it means to be redeemed goes goes about as far as, don't do drugs or have sex before marriage and you'll be good. That's her mindset. It's obvious she wants to help people, but she has no clue how to do it. There's no doubt that's the message being implied in these first few episodes, and to be honest, it's a great jumping off point. Imagine all the conversations that could be had about how impersonal and damaging her process is. The ramifications of defining a person by their current problems over understanding Understanding where the need to indulge in that behavior comes from. It would have opened up so many opportunities for character growth from not only the patrons, but Charlie too, making her question whether she should be running the hotel in the first place. And with how adamant the early season was about showcasing the stupidity of her methods, I thought that was the direction they were taking, but weirdly, it's not. Those conversations don't happen. That negative effect isn't shown. Charlie doesn't get called out at any stage. If anything, she's kind of validated? I mean, like I said, in episode 5, it starts with her freaking out that the hotel isn't working, but her solution to this isn't, I should switch up my methods, or I need to connect with the patrons better. It's, I need to make my case to a higher authority in heaven. But not in the, I'm in way over my head, I should ask heaven what it takes to be redeemed type of way you'd expect, no. She goes there to prove that the hotel does work. Yeah, she does a complete 180 on her opinion out of nowhere, as if her freaking out over the hotel failing never happened. And what's stranger still is that no one points this out. There isn't a single character that acknowledges she basically deflected the question. They all just go along with the notion like, of course, that's what we needed to do, talk to heaven. And before you know it, she's trying to plead her case that the hotel works and her patrons have bettered themselves as a result of it. All that 
that buildup implying she'd been going about this the wrong way doesn't amount to anything. She even goes as far as to have them look at Angel Dust's actions during a night out to determine if he's improved. And initially, in reaction to this setup, I thought, oh, I get it. Charlie's in denial about the effectiveness of the hotel, and that's gonna come through when Heaven sees that Angel hasn't gotten better. After all, he only stopped denying he had problems in episode 4, and in episode 5, he's apparently still got drug stashes, meaning he clearly hasn't made much progress. So, the only logical explanation for why Charlie would think otherwise is that she's actively deluding herself. That must be why she didn't question her methods when faced with the reality of the hotel not working. She doesn't want to admit that anything about her approach is wrong or damaging, and this trial is gonna be what forces her to concede. She'll see firsthand that Angel hasn't improved, Heaven will deny her plea, she'll come back to hell a broken person believing she's a failure, she'll realize her faults before the extermination, she'll apologize to Angel and the others for not realizing sooner, and they'll all stay to protect the hotel, seeing she's finally come to her senses. That's why they protect the hotel in the finale. It all makes sense now. But oh wait, that isn't what happens. Not at all. Because Charlie doesn't fail to prove that Angel has changed. How is that possible, you ask? Well, contrary to everything I just said, it turns out that Angel has indeed mostly gotten over his vices. When did he find the time to recover so drastically over such a non-existent time frame? Who knows? This series is a massive clusterfuck of a timeline if there ever was one, so I can never tell how much time passes between each episode. At the start, they say there's six months to go, then episode two and three are right after, but episode four says there isn't much time, episode 5 says there's only a few months, episode 6 says there's one month. I couldn't tell you for the life of me when Angel got better off screen or how long it took, but I can tell you this much. I know precisely why his arc jumped ahead so far so quickly. Pacing. Remember that? When I mentioned how this series will kneecap any potentially meaningful shit to move on to the next predetermined plot point? Yep. Here it is again. You see, going back to that ever so sought after final battle of the hotel fighting off angels, in order for it to happen, Charlie first needed to provoke them into targeting her, so boom, that's what the trial's for. Charlie has to prove sinners can be redeemed, so heaven will deny her anyway, proving the game was rigged from the start and her only remaining option to stop the extermination is to fight. But oh no, there isn't enough time for Angel to show consistent meaningful growth leading up to this episode. That won't do. The plot demands he be further along in his development. So to make sure it goes as intended, they do a little magic trick. One second Angel has severe issues but can admit to them. The next, he's totally drug free and openly caring. Fucking incredible. It's got all the time saving bullshit of the other plot sacrifice sacrifices, reducing Angel's progress to yet another narrative tool, but in addition to that, it also sort of implies, no, no, let's cut the bullshit, it declares that the hotel works, and don't you try to tell me that it doesn't. The trial is to prove if the hotel can redeem sinners. Angel is used as evidence for how well the hotel works. He's intentionally been sped along in his growth to show that he's improved thanks to the hotel. Another member of the staff says the hotel tell isn't a setback in his life, and as he's hanging out with his friend, he tries to recruit her for the hotel. Pretty much everything in episode 6 is telling the audience that the hotel does its job and Angel is thankful for it, despite all our exposure to the hotel hinting the opposite. And it doesn't stop there either. In fact, the series continues validating the hotel on a meta level by having it so in the finale, after Pinches sacrifices himself, a move implied to be the result of his never properly showcased improvements we didn't see him make at the hotel, he goes to heaven. That's right. After not even seeing him go through any kind of progress over the series, Pinchus goes to heaven, implying that Charlie's methods worked on him. 
Do you want me to think her tactics work or not show? Everything up to episode 5 implied they weren't working and Charlie was incompetent. That was the show. And I'm guessing that at some point, same as Angel Dust, that was gonna be her arc. That Charlie needs to get rid of the youth counselor shit and really dig deep if she wants to connect with the patrons. That's why it's the highlight of the first batch of episodes. It was gonna be the thing that defined her character and solidified the hotel as being viable. But again, same as Angel, Hasbin doesn't have enough time for that. By the time they'd set up how the hotel wasn't working, they needed it to be working. So suddenly, in a flash, it was. And that whole plot thread was thrown to the wolves. Or in other words, the show got so caught up in moving the plot forward, hitting all the beats to get to that fucking golden goose of a finale no matter what it took, they just forgot. There's no better word to describe this. The show forgot that she was meant to be called out since for the finale to work, everyone had to be positively affected by the hotel and willing to die for it. They couldn't have a discussion about the hotel not working right before defending it with their lives. That wouldn't make any sense. So second verse, same as the first, they performed their little magic trick. One second, Charlie can't do shit and the hotel doesn't mean anything to anyone living there. The next, her methods work so well and everyone Everyone is so bonded to it, they're willing to fight for and rebuild it bigger than ever, so she can continue not being able to help more people until the plot randomly says she can. Ah! <sighs> and you want to know the worst parts? That whole extended rant there only gave an argument for why angels shouldn't be willing to die for heaven. One character. That shit helped me argue against the legitimacy of one character believing in the hotel. Well, on to the rest of them. But first off, let's briefly mention the characters who, rationally speaking, should believe in the hotel, just to add a bit of distinction here. We gotta be fair. Least surprisingly, you've got Charlie, the main protagonist. It's her dream for the hotel to work, so her defending it is symbolically the same as her defending her dream. A dream that's shared by her girlfriend, Vaggie, who's willing to fight for whatever Charlie believes in for fairly obvious reasons, alongside Lucifer, who's less there to protect the hotel, but his daughter from being killed. After them, there's Alistair, the shady character who supposedly helps Charlie to have a good time watching the hotel fail. We actually don't quite know his motivation for protecting the hotel with his life, but episode 5 implies he does have one that he doesn't want to talk about, so I'll take Madrano's word there. I'll also throw in Nifty the housemaid, purely for the fact that she's such a simple gag character with so little in the way of characterization beyond gremlin and loves cleaning slash bad boys, it could be argued either way if it makes sense for her to defend the hotel. Personally, I'd argue it isn't, as we never see her form a bond with anyone, though honestly I'm not sure if she has the capacity to do so or even have opinions, but then again, she's such a nothing character, it doesn't really matter, so I'll give it to them, they can have her. And oh boy, does she help right? Found out this batch of valid justifications or what? We've got protagonist, girlfriend, dad, don't know, and either or. I would say this lineup is embarrassing, seeing as the point of them fighting together was that it symbolized their shared belief in the hotel, yet almost every character I listed is either doing it more for Charlie or an unspecified purpose, but it pretty much speaks for itself, so why be redundant? Anyway, moving on to the cast members who shouldn't want to defend the hotel, let's start with Sir Pentius, as he's the closest to being justified out of those who shouldn't. Having a very achievable, almost instantly accomplished dream of simply wanting a place to belong. That's it. He was this pathetic guy who hoped to fit in with the bigger powers of hell but couldn't, so after being thoroughly rejected by everyone else, Charlie extended a hand, making him feel welcome for the first time in his afterlife. The work was basically done already, he'd been given a place to belong, he'd met people he could connect with, he should have been bonded to the hotel and its staff by the end of the season. 
But alas, somehow it all falls apart in execution. Or should I say, the lack thereof. <laughs> Let me tell you. If Angel doesn't get enough screen time to properly develop, then Pinchus is a fucking background character. At the very least, Angel got an episode about the start of his stupidly short journey. Outside of his introduction, I'm not sure if Pinchus ever had more than three minutes of dedicated screen time per episode. Forget seeing his process, we don't even know what he needs to be redeemed for. That's how underutilized he is over this entire season. Saying he doesn't have a connection to the hotel is an understatement. He barely has a character. Really, I don't think he was included for any reason other than being the arbitrary sacrifice to prove the hotel works. I mean, who else were they gonna sacrifice? Angel Dust? The guy the show was hyping up as the prime example of a sinner improving? No, they can't do that. Angel has depth. He has goals. He has relationships with other characters. He's a fan favorite. Killing him off this early would be shocking and interesting. The horror, could you imagine? No, 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 that's not gonna work. Better to kill off the guy that didn't matter to begin with. That's a safe bet. People won't mind too much if he dies, but you know what? I do. By God, my man wasn't a complex character, but he was fun. He was charming. He deserved better. Fuck you, show. Pentius was nowhere near close enough with the hotel for this to be a meaningful gesture. This was a forced martyring, and damn you all to double hell for it. And naturally segueing away from that, going to our next character that shouldn't have any connection to the hotel, we've got Husk, the bartender that's forced to be there by Alistair, who owns his soul. That's his original cause for being here, it's an obligation he doesn't enjoy, and he isn't shy about expressing it. From Husk's introduction onwards, he's super standoffish and doesn't like anyone, and that's how it stays until episode 4, where, surprisingly, he and Angel find a connection over both knowing what it's like to hit rock bottom, and I bring this up during an explanation of why he wouldn't believe in the hotel, because Husk's approach to connecting with Angel is, in the moment, blatantly meant to contrast Charlie's approach that we see fail Angel earlier in the same episode. Whereas her tactics are impersonal and try to solve problems before understanding their cause, making Angel internalize those problems more as part of his identity, Husk addresses the root. That Angel won't let anyone in out of an assumption that no one understands him. He thinks he's alone in the world, unable to find anyone who can relate to his troubles, and Charlie doesn't help by saying that everything's gonna be alright when Angel knows it isn't. That brand of reassuring sugary sentiment doesn't mean anything to him, as it's glaringly coming from the mouth of someone who doesn't know, and Husk understands this, so he does something different. He chooses to be honest, telling Angel that his situation is bad, that things aren't gonna be okay, at least not right away. But if the two of them face it together with open arms, it might not stay so bad. They don't have to be defined by their trauma. To the contrary, it can be a source of motivation for them to rise above. All it takes to start that journey is to not let it keep them down, and with that said, for the first time in the entire series, Angel drops the act. He stops masking his insecurities in sexual innuendos and a confident, cocky facade, lowering his boundaries thanks to Hus treating him with respect rather than pity. It's one of the few times in the series where two characters organically connect on a deep, personal level, making it undoubtedly my favorite scene in the whole series, as it's the one instance of has been doing what I expected it to. But more importantly, getting back to the point, it's also accomplished by literally doing everything Charlie and the hotel don't. Husk is, in essence, making a statement about the hotel's inefficiency by demonstrating to the audience how it's done right. And this matches with his behavior so far. Earlier in this episode, he criticized Charlie for using the hotel as a means of avoiding her own issues, and up to this moment, he's shown nothing but contempt for the hotel itself. He shouldn't feel any attachment to the building or its residents other than Angel, and I already know what you're thinking. Angel stays behind to protect the hotel, so maybe Husk is staying for him. But you're forgetting, I've already proven that Angel shouldn't have any attachment to the hotel either, so if Husk staying for him is the explanation, it's invalid. Angel shouldn't have wanted to protect the hotel with his life, so by extension, Husk shouldn't have either. Him going drinking with the rest of the cast once is not enough to change that. For the 
fifth or so time thus far, it's evident that he only comes around to the hotel so the finale of them all banding together can work. It's as simple as that, and it's equally applicable to Angel's friend Cherry Bomb, who's only there to back up Angel and says she doesn't believe in the hotel at all in an earlier episode, yet inexplicably, after the fight, she's just, like, part of the main crew. She had no incentive to stick around or act as if she was bonded to the gang whatsoever, but she does so purely for the sake of, damn it, isn't it nice to see everyone come together after the fight? But no, it isn't, because they didn't earn it. Most of these characters are about as close to each other as I am to the fucking moon. For this type of, we're all in this together shit to work, everyone would have to be at least as close as Husk and Angel are, but from what we've seen, they barely know each other. They shouldn't be able to agree on what to get for takeout, let alone what to bet their lives on. It's totally unbelievable. Maybe if we spent the season watching them grow and form friendships while trying to get redeemed, I could see it, but... You cut all that shit out for plots. Charlie learning to take better care of her patrons? Dropped. Angel slowly opening up? Rushed. Pinch just doing much of anything? Gone. All of them were cut for time. And good riddance, I say. Who needs to see characters becoming better people in a show about characters becoming better people? What are you, stupid? We don't have time for that. We've got 10 more plot threads to open next episode, and we can't cut them. They're gonna be really important five seasons from now. We gotta think about the future here. The present is tomorrow's yesterday. We can't waste it on natural character developments. Just say they grew off screen and it'll be fine. After all, that's how we handle giving them depth beyond their basic character traits. Like, did you know Vaggie's critical of everything due to hating herself? Or that Charlie wants to help others to avoid dealing with her own problems? Me neither. It's a good thing Hus basically turned to the camera and said as much, or we'd have no idea that was the case. Now that's how you know a show is well written. When the cast looks right at the camera with no shame and says, oh, you think I'm fake, a guy I barely know? Well, for your information, I to fulfill the role society has given me. Also, I go to CD bars so I can forget how much I hate everything, and hopefully if I self-destruct enough, my abuser will let me go. Ah, you unzip me, ah, ah. This is how a normal person reacts to basic questioning. By the way, in case it wasn't understood, I'm not knocking Angel's trauma. It's honestly one of the few well-handled serious conflicts of the show, as I said, but come on, you have to admit, this shit is comically artificial and forced. Like, it's cool they want to give the cast these complex mannerisms that, under analysis, reveal deeper struggles and personal flaws. The ideas being presented are all really good in theory, I see the intention on paper, but what trips them up in practice is that either A, the writers don't have time to show those mannerisms, so they just said they existed and told us what they meant, or B, they did show them, but there wasn't enough time to convey their underlying meaning, so they just skipped ahead and told us what they meant. Are you picking up on the pattern here? The writers cannot imply traits or convey their significance for shit. They want the cast to be multifaceted, that much is obvious, but they either don't have the time or they don't want to put in the work to insert it naturally. So in a display of pure creative bankruptcy, they just have the characters say it, breaking the main rule of visual storytelling and making the audience feel condescended to. It's a choice that ruins any investment a viewer might have had by talking down to them rather than letting them figure shit out on their own. For example, one of the few interesting things Charlie's got going on is that she and her dad are kind of distant. So how do you think they let the audience know that? Does she see other characters acting fatherly and look uncomfortable, avoid answering questions about her lineage, accidentally reveal her apprehension through the hotel activities? All good guesses if you're a tacky, unoriginal bitch. But Hasbin does something downright unexpected. In episode one, it has Alistair say that Charlie has daddy issues. Then, in episode five, Charlie is questioned on if she has daddy issues, to which she says, We have just never been close. And the cast reaffirms this assertion by repeating, Daddy issues. I swear to god, I'm not fucking exaggerating. This is how they handle every conflict in character traits. The writers don't think you can get what they're going for because they're shit at writing. They have a character bluntly say what they're going for since they can't think of any other way to do it. And we, the audience, sigh in agony. Rinse and repeat, 
for eight episodes until the end. And I genuinely could keep listing them for days. It's fucking endless. And believe me, they're all hilarious in their varied yet equally unbridled lack of subtlety. But if I were to pick one that had the most negative impact on the story overall, it wouldn't be a particular trait or conflict, but rather the entire character of Adam, the main villain this season. As he does a phenomenal job illustrating the core failures of this writing style. Great concept, loads of potential, ruined by a lack of creativity or effort. And he really is a major disappointment considering what he could have been. The basic idea surrounding his character is that as the first human allowed into heaven, he's over time developed a massive ego thinking he can do no wrong. Using his divine status as an excuse for why he commits genocide on a regular basis. He's an antithesis to the typical perception of angels, exposing the loopholes in heaven's system where once you've ascended, being a good person essentially becomes optional since there's no way you can come back down. Adam's mere existence in the story is meant to represent the unfair, backwards nature of hell and heaven that allows sinners to have their souls destroyed while pardoning anything done by the angels. And so with that in mind, I think it goes without saying that you could take him in so many fun directions. Think of the possibilities. He could be a holier-than-thou preacher who seriously believes the extermination are just punishment, a strict rule follower who sees any minor violation as worthy of death, a deceptively calm, rational person who's only able to maintain such a demeanor by labeling his horrific actions as though he had no other choice. He's a personality begging to be given depth as a villain. The ideas just naturally flow when you think about it, but... Unfortunately, I'm sad to say, he suffers from a chronic disease known as Being and Has Been Hotel, a series where everything's about as subtle as a dagger to the face. So, regretfully, for him to fit in, he had to leave any substance he could have had at the door. Perhaps in another show he could have been different, serving as a strong antagonist while also being complex, but sadly, Has Been doesn't have the time to flesh anything out. They need to get right to the point as soon as possible, so in order to immediately get across what Adam's main role in the story is, that being as a bad guy, they skip the pretenses and choose to make him such a two-dimensional, transparently despicable jackass, it's surprising we never hear him say, man, I sure do hate women. But believe me, he does get very close, and judging by his character audition sheet, it seems that was gonna be a defining quirk of his, but I take it they toned it back to keep from being too on the nose. Like, yeah, he swears every other word, acts overly annoying, has the brain of a six-year-old, and literally says the extermination is fun, but... Misogyny? Nah, that'd be too cliched. We aren't that obvious. <laughs> it's funny because they are. And look, don't get me wrong, I love a good bastard. Some of my favorite villains are Judge Claude Frollo, Terrence Fletcher, Lord Shin, Yoshikage Kira. Adam being irredeemably evil and unlikable isn't the problem. In fact, another antagonist this season, Angel's Pimp and serial abuser Valentino, is pretty damn good filling the same general role. The only difference is that unlike Adam, Valentino and all the other characters I mentioned feel like real people. We don't just know them for their goals and the face they put on in front of others. We see their fears, their anxieties, what's going through their head when they aren't being an active threat. We get to know the full scope of who these fuckers are and how they turned out the way they have. It helps invest us in seeing the heroes hopefully triumph knowing what sort of monsters they truly are. But we don't really know Adam. Adam, not as a person. We do know the atrocities he's committed, we know he's hell-bent on continuing those atrocities, we know he takes advantage of Heaven's perks to be an annoying asshole and justify those atrocities, but... Why? Why does he want to kill demons so badly? It's easy to understand why he sees himself as superior, that's one thing, but what was his reasoning for suggesting the exterminations? It's made clear that wasn't what the other leaders of heaven wanted, so why Adam? At best, you could turn to his line about how he sees the exterminations as entertainment, but that's not, like, a moral conviction. He isn't so starved for enjoyment he turns to the exterminations out of pure boredom. He's just saying that to reinforce 
course that he's an asshole. That's what everything he does is meant to do. He's defined by his actions more than anything else, but none of these actions imply anything other than, this is why you should hate him. And that's boring. If a bad guy has to randomly stab a puppy every second to remind you why he's bad, he's probably not a well-written bad guy. It's not enough to make them do reprehensible things, they need to have a motive for doing them. Take Lord Shen. He starts Kung Fu Panda 2 doing the literal exact same thing as Adam, leading a genocide. But what elevates Shen above Adam in terms of pure wickedness is that plain and simple, we know why he did it. Shen was told a panda would stop him if he chose to become a dictator, so he preemptively killed them all to take over China unopposed. Think about what that says. That Shen was so obsessed with power and paranoid at his own future that he murdered thousands of innocent people people to make sure one wouldn't rise up against him. How insanely heartless and cowardly is that? It tells you everything you need to know about who he is and why you should hate him without feeling the need to remind you over and over again through seeing him kill people in every scene. Because you don't just hate Shin for what he did, you hate him for why he did it. But Adam doesn't have any motivation, there's no goal he's striving towards besides killing all the demons. There's no fear he's acting on besides the demons might stop us from killing them. There's no justification for him doing what he does besides killing demons is fun. Everything he is as a person goes back to his actions, and all his actions tell us is that he's a bad guy. What type of bad guy? The bad guy. The one that exists purely to be the antagonist of season one until the cast eventually beats him. And in the end, that's all he is. Nothing more, nothing less. What you see is what you get. Pretty ironic for a series that's all about people having more to them than meets the eye, but on the other hand, Adam isn't really a person, more a plot device, so touche has been. Touche. In all seriousness though, Adam genuinely is a total fucking disaster villain-wise, and I'd have been willing to fully ignore his existence if it weren't for his song Hell is Forever, which, I'm not gonna lie, is super catchy and fun, as is most of the music. The songwriters Andrew Underberg and Sam Holt are the same crew that does all the music for Hell of a Boss, and yeah, you can tell. They do a variety of interesting styles and motifs, ranging from old Broadway to electro swing to rock opera. They're usually pretty clever with their rhyme schemes and experiment a lot. The production and writing are good, is what I'm trying to say, and the Broadway performers they got to handle the material do a wonderful job. Everyone 100% did the best that they possibly could with the resources they had, and it led to several unironic bangers. You're not gonna hear me knocking the music or songwriting in this video. No, I'm just gonna knock everything surrounding the songs, since, as I was shocked to discover, there are episodes attached to these amazing music videos that, to say the least, knock a few of them down quite a bit when put into context. For instance, one of the songs I really enjoy, Out For Love, has great energy and instrumentation. However, the message it's delivering when you pay attention to the lyrics and content makes no sense. See, the song is this super nice sounding Spanish guitar dance number performed by Miss Hollow Knight, who, in training Vaggy how to kill angels, advises her that she needs to fight for love rather than vengeance. And in the moment, it's treated as if she dropped a bomb. Like, whoa, Vaggy fighting for love? No way, I never considered that. After all, that's only been her motivation for doing literally everything in the show so far. How could we have known? It's not like a majority of Vaggy's screen time is dedicated to helping Charlie, leaving little to no room for her to have her own problems, or that her being revealed as a former angel had no impact due to us knowing nothing about her besides being Charlie's girlfriend. And it's certainly not like her one song is about how she defines herself by her ability to protect Charlie, not mentioning vengeance once. Nah, this is unprecedented. We were all so blind. And as a matter of fact, so was Vaggy apparently, seeing as she regains the wings she lost before, symbolically becoming whole again. And man, isn't that great? She finally knows who she is. Forget when she said her whole existence centered around protecting Charlie. That didn't happen. It was all part 
part of your imagination. Jet fuel can't melt steel beams. She was under the influence of an evil wizard hiding her true self that solely wanted vengeance and had to be told otherwise. You aren't remembering right, you fucking idiots. <sighs> I guess I should have known that no matter how good the songs are, they're ultimately gonna come back to doing the same bullshit Hasman always does, but eh, look on the bright side. There's way more songs that just repeat information instead of setting new status quos entirely. That's preferable, isn't it? Like, sure, respectless, whatever it takes, welcome to heaven, all these songs and more might relay ideas that could have been summed up in two sentences max, but at least they aren't gaslighting us. We know what they're saying isn't contradictory to what we've seen so far. That's a plus, right? I mean, for any other show, it wouldn't be. It would be the standard, but you know, Hasbin really understands how to make you appreciate the flow of information by showing us how much we've been taking it for granted. Other shows, they explain things at a normal rate and let characters develop on screen and don't waste the viewer's time with songs that fill up runtime they could have used better elsewhere and set themselves up with realistic expectations to keep from cramming in things that won't get a spotlight. Ha! I say, ha, how do you expect to cultivate an audience by doing what everyone else does? That's not what they're looking for. You gotta keep them on their toes, always guessing whether or not a concept will end up decently executed. It'll make them appreciate when the show isn't terrible all the more. Sometimes they'll get the right amount of focus, sometimes they'll be rushed as hell, sometimes they'll barely be addressed in a one-off line or two, sometimes they'll start out strong but get forgotten over time, and well, Sometimes they won't be addressed at all despite having integral importance to the plot. Namely, anything having to do with who anyone was before they ended up in hell. Something you'd think would be a major part of the story, given the show is supposed to be predicated on sinners redeeming themselves out of damnation, but the weird thing is, they don't treat it as being redeemed for what sinners did on Earth to end up in hell to begin with. They laser in on what the sinners have done in hell as if their lives started there. Not a single time mentioning what led them to hell in the first place. And that's so strange, as I thought it would be the basis for a larger discussion in the show, and why wouldn't it? There's plenty of back and forth on the ambiguity of what it takes to get into heaven, not even the angels knowing how they got there, but what does it take to get into hell? That's the question I want to know. Morality is an inherently subjective matter when you think about it. There could be an infinite number of possibilities for what counts as behavior that's so bad it deserves hellfire. In certain religions, merely being gay is enough, not believing in the right god, working on a Sunday, eating beef or shellfish or the meat of someone else's spouse. <laughs> I'm not sorry for that. My point is, rules for why a person deserves to be in hell can be just as unclear as those for why a person should be in heaven. And if that notion were acknowledged, Charlie's stance on the matter would make so much more sense. In the show proper, her justification for wanting to save people is, frankly, super vague. Of course, you've got people like Pinchus and Angel who aren't nearly as bad as they first appear, but a majority of the sinners we come across are seemingly irredeemable. As Lucifer says in episode 5, most of his and Charlie's people are bloodthirsty, ravenous psychopaths bent on causing as much destruction as humanly possible. That's why hell is such a shithole. The sinners make it that way from constantly fighting for turf and killing each other. It's a setting that completely undermines the idea of sinners being redeemable, and in the end, while Charlie does convince Lucifer to trust in her dream, she never refutes his point. She doesn't have a proper rebuttal for what her dad says about their people, but if the parameters for getting into hell were as easy as anything I listed, that would put everything in a totally different light. It would simultaneously explain why Charlie believes the exterminations are unjust while giving us insight into how cruel heaven truly is. At the moment, them killing so many sinners doesn't seem that bad considering how many of them unequivocally deserve death, but if the majority of sinners were there for little things, that would be a total game changer. It would turn so many blatant issues around, but 
it isn't the case. They completely missed the chance to mention people closer to the middle of the spectrum, and I think it was purely to preserve the aesthetics of true bad and good afterlives over giving a more nuanced perspective that takes into account all types of people. It's a massive missed opportunity, and moving away from the benefits it would have in the grander scheme of the narrative, there's also a metric shit ton of character building that's right there waiting to be utilized. How many doors for insight would be opened if we knew who these people were before they ended up in hell? What details and origins for character traits would we be able to dissect? It's innately an interesting topic rife for exploration that could have led to so many inferences and greater judgments about the characters. There's a reason one of the most popular videos on has been is a discussion speculating how the characters died. People want to know the ins and outs of who these guys are. That's why the initial concept of the show the crew so heavily deviated from was appealing. It offered us the prospect of diving deeper into the complexities of these intriguing should-be villains from various points in history. And that's another thing. Have you ever noticed how shockingly slim the mention of or allusion to what time most of the main cast came from is? They're a tad more open with one-off side characters like Mimsy, Rosie, and Zestial who've got distinct dialects, looks, and personality traits that give you a good summation of where they came from. And as an exception, Alistair fits the bill as his gimmick, but why doesn't this standard apply to most of the main cast? Why isn't there anything to help us get that Angel died in 1947, or Husk in the 70s, or Pinchus in 1888? Those are some big disparities with huge cultural differences that should come through in their personalities, yet most of them act like semi-modern 20 to 30 year olds, excluding Husk, who's got an older feel despite ironically having been in hell for the shortest time. I just don't understand why their age and former lives don't ever come up in so much as an offhand comment when it's their choices in the living world that led them here. I swear, it's as if the series was so caught up in its own lore building and story, it forgot that a regular human world exists in this universe, like heaven and hell are the start of people's lives and everything else that came before is all irrelevant. And don't go for the excuse of, oh, maybe they're saving it for season two. This isn't the type of shit you wait a whole season before clarifying not intentionally. We need to stop pretending the crew have everything put together when it's so frustratingly evident that they don't. They have a load of passion, that's evident, and I admire them doing all they can in spite of their limitations, but practically speaking, passion can only take you so far before running out. As the old saying goes, every corpse on Mount Everest was once an extremely motivated person. It's not as simple as wishing really hard for the best outcome and everything turning out okay. You need to have realistic goals before trying something so difficult, and straight up, Hasbin didn't have realistic goals. It wanted to be a serialized slice of life comedy, a story-driven, lore-heavy critique of religious persecution, a character-driven, introspective look at how society handles rejects, a big, show-stopping musical spectacular, and all in the span of eight 24-minute episodes. And listen, I know they most likely had a larger episode order cut down to what exists now. I sympathize with the crew and their predicament if that's the case, but it's when you're faced with that kind of drawback that more than ever, you need to adapt. Cut out what isn't working, reorient the narrative to fit within the boundaries you currently have. You can't stubbornly attempt to follow the exact same plan when the game has changed so drastically. That's gonna lead to disaster, and Hasbin's writing is a perfect example of how. As a reminder, this is all speculation on my part, so do take it with a grain of salt, but from how I read this whole production, it seems the crew came in with a super narrow view of what they wanted to do in a season. How arcs were gonna play out, how much lore we were gonna get, how characters would look, what developments needed to happen, what characters and set pieces had to be introduced, and then when they didn't 
didn't quite get what was needed for those plans to naturally play out, they duct taped it all together into an abridged, less polished version of itself to avoid leaving anything behind. And I get it. It can be hard to drop ideas you come up with and know will be great if you could just get the chance to use them, but that's what separates a good product from a fantastic one. Just look at the filmography of Don Bluth. That man is a fantastic creative. He knows how to come up with wonderful ideas, just like Madrano and crew, but the products he's most well known for aren't the ones where he had unlimited control. Those are the ones that flopped both critically and financially for being too unfocused and undercooked. No, the films he's best remembered for are the ones he made with other people that could rein in his creative thoughts. They they helped guide him and his crew to focus on what would work best over what sounded best theoretically. And in the end, it probably did lead to some good shit being cut, but the final films were better for it. They were improved by getting other people's input, and it looks like that's what this show was sorely missing. Again, I can't speak on the production itself, I wasn't part of it, but judging by the media itself, it seems to me that the crew were given full creative control with very few notes from the studio, letting them have the final say to ensure it stayed as close to what fans wanted as possible. It was their vision they were allowed to pursue unfettered, and if that is how it happened, I fully understand why the show is like it is. And I'm not saying that as a dig at the crew, they have the capacity to make great work, and there are hints of that greatness in Has Been Hotel. But for any first time showrunner given that level of authority with no supervision or external input and highly limited resources? What do you expect to happen? It ain't rocket science to figure out what that formula is gonna lead to. I'm surprised it's half as organized as it is. The fact it isn't nigh incomprehensible is an achievement unto itself. I'm almost more impressed than disappointed, but first TV show or not, this isn't an indie production anymore. It's a professional series released on a major streaming service with advertisements in Times Square. So while it is a major step forward that exemplifies the passionate talent of creators, it's only fair to look at it from the same standard as everything else. Any less would be condescending, and on that level, has been is a mess. An interesting, fun mess with a lot of potential, one I'm looking forward to seeing continue for the worthwhile ideas it does present, but a mess nonetheless. And I know that's harsh, this whole video is, but it's because I see what the show could be and I can feel the potential almost in my grasp until I look down to see I've fallen off the cliff Wiley Coyote style. It's amazing the show is doing as well as it is right now, I'm not gonna downplay all that that means, but if it wants to be both successful and the best possible version of itself? It needs to adjust to its surroundings. I've been just stop. You've been waiting for me to make a reference to Verbalace, there it is. And thanks for watching.